In your opinion, how has the idea of biology as a software, reading, writing, programming, and debugging sort of held up over time? Well, metaphors are imperfect. I, I, I think they're, um, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages of using these metaphors. It, 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 I'm, I'm a programmer since, uh, you know, the mid sixties uh, as a preteen, uh, and, and I've been programming both computers and biology. And I find that the metaphor really works, uh, for me personally, where it breaks down a little bit is um, when you s say that your goals should be set by the goals of the metaphor. In other words, that in the early days of synthetic biology, there were multiple camps. And one of them was the camp where we're going to have NAND gates and OR gates and uh, if then else's and all the Boolean logic uh, that might characterize a certain category of compute computation uh, electronics, um, and I and I felt and I still feel that, that that there's a lot to be a lot of interesting biology that occurs with analog circuits, uh, and we've kind of lost track that, or some of us have lost track of that key component of electronics, um, but it is there. But anyway, the analogs there's uh, the evolution um, where you, typically when you make a cell phone, as far as I know you make a very small number of prototypes that are very similar to one another and you test them out. But in biology, like I've said a couple of times now, you can make billions and trillions and you can do accelerated evolution uh, while with most, you know, bridge building and building trains and jets and cell phones, you, you really don't have that luxury of making trillions of them and seeing which one works best. Let's talk about how writing the human genome may help us better understand it. So Francis Collins described the working draft of the human genome as the first glimpse of our own instruction book. But today, many scientists believe that to truly understand the instruction book, we also have to write it. Can you explain why that is? Right. Uh, well, I'm not sure I would say have to, but it is certainly very advantageous. Uh, I, I should mention that we don't even have the full instruction book of any human being yet, uh, we have um, it, we have the it, as we declared victory in two thousand and one on a kind of a rough draft of ninety two percent. Actually, it was considered the the, the final draft of a, of a rough draft in two thousand and one. It was final draft in two thousand and four, but it was still haploid, meaning it was just one genome. While all almost uh, essentially all of us are uh, diploid, uh, inheritance from mother and father, uh, except for our gametes. Um, so the, the, the sequence we have, the one human genome that we have uh, is not of a gamete, it's of a strange haploid cell. So, that, so that's part of the, but that's not the big barrier to understanding. The big barrier is, as you say, is, is in order to understand how something works and also in order to develop new technologies, you need to be able to, to write and edit and alter, and uh, and you understand it because you'll you'll say, "Gee, I have no idea." It's it's like reverse engineering electronic circuit or some software. So I have no idea what this code does. Let's let's change it, and and then you say, "Oh, that that changes the calendar." Okay, so that that code does calendar, uh, or in the case of the biology, you'll 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 take a piece out, and now it no longer handles, you know. Um, uh, Glucose. So you say, okay, that's part of the glucose monitoring system. And, and you can just get through that and you can get to more and more nuanced changes for discovery's sake, but it's often entangled with not just discovering, but making useful uh, synthetic biology. Um, there, you'll have a, um, a challenge that you'll have out there and that will drive the reading and writing technology forward. It will drive our creativity in terms of how these things can positively influence uh, society and ecosystems. What's the goal of writing a large or a whole genome or an entire chromosome? So um, there, there are a few uh, ideas that, that, have, that have come up where one, where uh, something at a genomic scale is more desirable than a single gene. So a huge fraction of 
um, recombinant DNA, synth GMOs, and synthetic biology historically has been changing one or two genes. And you don't, it doesn't make sense to synthesize the whole genome if you just want to change one or two genes. But more and more, we're seeing uh, advantages of changing so many genes, you might as well uh, rewrite the thing. And as an example of that, um, we have a project to change the genetic code to make any cell resistant to all viruses. And we just published a paper where we think we did that. Uh, um, uh, and uh, the, the, the way that it works is that the virus, all viruses, uh, as far as we know, depend on the host genetic code, the translation ribosomal machinery. And uh, if you, you can change the code without hurting the host, that the host could be a cell, it could be a, an organism. Um, so far, we've only done it in one industrial organism, uh, E. coli. But anyway, if you, if you change that enough, the virus can't mutate. Uh, there's, there'd be too many changes that are required to get the virus uh, to, um, to be back to its healthy state. So, um, and we think that this is completely general in that essentially every plant, microbe, and animal on Earth shares a very similar genetic code to one another, and in any case have a genetic code that they share with the viruses. And if you take it offline, change it enough, like sometimes as few as two codons, um, let's say two codons that code for, for serine, leucine, and arginine are our favorites ones because there's, they have so many codons for each. They're, they're triplets of A, C, G, and T. So, so like AAA codes for lysine, the amino acid lysine. So you ch there's 64 of those. And if you change one, you get a new genetic code. You can change two, and now you get something that's multivirus resistant. Um, so that's an example where you have to make so many changes, tens of thousands of changes on the genome wide, and they're interspersed throughout the genome. You might as well just synthesize it. And that's what was done. Um, another example is, uh, de-extinction. There, the number of changes you might have to make in order to bring back, uh, some physiology like cold resistance. Uh, and, and all the traits that go along with cold resistance may be scattered and round enough that you're, uh, you can think of it either as highly multiplex editing or as, re as a complete rewrite. And even when you do a complete rewrite, you're not changing every single base pair, all uh, 3 billion times two uh, bases. You're leaving them mostly intact. You've, you've chemically synthesized it, but, but it's still useful to think of it as a lot of edits. So, you know, sort of a new, the, our, the maximum number of edits we've done um, by editing, meaning having an enzyme that's targeted at a particular place is 24,000. And the maximum we've done by synthesis is on the, is almost the same amount. Um, although we have synthetic projects, which are now getting close to done at 60,000. But then we're going to take the, the editing up to a million pretty soon. So it, it, they, they go back and forth. There's this a technical uh, one up leapfrogging that goes on between editing and writing of genomes. This sort of moonshot goal of changing genomes or writing large genomes in a way, uh, writing, editing them, where, you know, as you mentioned, you make, let's say, you, you take a human cell and in a Petri dish, make it resistant to viruses or, um, you know, make it capable of synthesizing essential micronutri micronutrients that we usually have to get from our diet. Like even if it just sits in a Petri dish forever and that's all, that's all the only place it goes, uh, to me, that's, there's something very just fundamentally, you know, awe inspiring about that. Um, is that, is that something, is that kind of a, like along the lines of, uh, your, your thinking with the, with doing some of those things? Yeah, I think I think the community, uh, the synthetic biology community, has responded very in, in the same kind of awe, uh, uh, inspiring uh, uh, the the initiation of this kind of project. I, I hesitate to call it a moonshot because I actually think the moonshot was not as inspiring to me as the satellites, uh, the 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 uh, GPS satellites, uh, the 
weather satellites and the um, um, you know surveillance of of uh, of, of land and uh, so and the same thing goes for other big projects. The genome project wasn't as impressive to me as the reducing the cost project, a thousand dollar genome project, sort of the technology development. And the Manhattan Project was certainly not as attractive to me as, say, the projects for uh, nuclear fusion, which could have, all of these things could have started much earlier on. They sound maybe a little bit harder, but they, what they have in common is they're, they're very much more consciously aimed at positive uh, um, societal uh, consequences. And I think it's uh, a little easier to get uh, everybody... Uh, excited about these sort of things. And I think uh, being able to make uh, industrial microorganisms, uh, plants and animals that are important for ecosystems and agriculture and, and, and human stem cells, they won't stay in that petri plate. They will make their way into um, um, cell therapies in humans. And if we're going to fix something that's broken, um, that you can fix with, with blood cells, you might as well have those blood cells be resistant to all viruses as well, if, if that is shown to be safe and effective by the FDA and, and similar organizations.